Couldn't hear me. Thanks a lot for inviting me. It's actually my uh, first talk. It's funny, but I like it. So it's, uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, so the title of the talk is uh, a little provocative. So the words integrable and probability are not typically used together. I will start by um, trying to explain what I mean by putting the two words together. So the first slide is, is designed to picture a kid's game, which smaller kids play. So, you have, uh, so the game is you have one by one by one cubes, and you're building a tower of those cubes. And it takes time for you to search for a new cube, so the arrival of the new cube is random. And then the tower starts growing, and hopefully a good, it doesn't fall soon enough. And so you want to know how tall the tower is going to be after some time. And now if, if there are plenty of cubes, then it's natural to assume that in the first approximation, the speed of growth of the tower is constant. So after time t, you're going to have the speed times t height. And the speed depends on your ability to look for it. So then, um, the next question would be fine. So, how about the fluctuations? How large do you expect them to be? And so the... Did you the say what the rules are again? No, I didn't say what the rules are. <laughs> <laughs> the search time is reasonably random. And there is a reason I'm not saying what the rules are. So, um, as you said, the problem is not, not well formulated. But then, still, can you solve it? <laughs> yeah. So, um, maybe. Mathematician answers no, actually, since this answer is different. <laughs> so, the, um, the way, there is a way to try to guess the answer. Now, what would that be? You make up the rules. And you try to make them as simple as you can so that you get some sort of an answer. And then you, you try to say that the game you're playing is close in some way to the game that you just made up, and so the answer should be reasonably close as well. So let's assume you haven't heard anything about probability. Okay, just erase it in your mind for the next five minutes. Let's try to be very naive. What's this, the simplest rule of the game? So arguably, the simplest rule of the game is that you have a discrete time, it takes, and every second, the probability half, you either put in your cube when you don't. That's simple enough. It's actually so simple that everything can be computed explicitly. So after time t, you count the number of ways or the probability that the tower has grown to height n, and you get this number, which you know is the binomial coefficient times the normalizing factor. And then a little bit more math, Stewart's formula tells you that the height at time t is going to be the first in the first approximation linear, and in the second approximation, it's going to fluctuate the square root of time, the square root of height, and the, the factor in front of the square root is going to be random, and its distribution is given by the bell-shaped curve, the Gaussian distribution. So this is the result. Well, Stewart's formula applied to this, and this is called Denoir plus central limit theory, what time obtained by Denoir almost 300 years ago, and then again by Laplace almost 200 years ago. And so that's the answer for the example. So that's what I would like to call an integrable example. That's an example of my problem that I can solve by an explicit formula, and I'm using Stewart's or something like that. Okay. So then the next reasonably natural step is to say that probably any quotation marks reasonable example should be close to the one that I just solved. And so I should be expecting the same answer. That statement is, is known under a fancy label of universality principle, which says that in a reasonable set of problems of realistic models, you should be seeing the same answer. And if your goal is to guess that answer, then you can find one integrable example, solve it, and there's your answer. It's a different issue how to prove 
that this is the same answer for the whole class of problems. And so in the particular example I'm discussing, if one puts the rules of the game much more broadly, so that the, the primes are independent, the weak are dependent, and, and, and so on, then this is known as the central limit theory that, that most of you have seen. And that theorem has, in, has been proved for the first time in 1901, which is almost 200 years later than the more of state. So guessing is easier than proving. We all know that. 200 years may be a little too much. Um, but my talk will be about finding the answer, finding the integrable examples in other situations, not this game, solving them, and then hoping that in a shorter time than 200 years from now, there will be an approach to actually prove the universality. Although the domain of problems that should have the same answer is actually pretty well drawn, partly by physicists, separate partly by mathematicians. But again, the, the ideas for the proof of the universality are so far late. Do you have an idea of the domain of the universality? Yes, the, how the universality class looks, I'll try to explain at least in one situation. Okay, so let me raise the space dimension by one, comparing to the example that I just gave. Now these are three, three different games, a little more complicated. So this one is just the, the game that I showed, duplicated many times in different columns. Cubes just fall randomly in columns without any interaction. So each column is the game from the previous discussion. Now this is, um, this is a, a more complicated game, which is when the cube falls, it looks left and right, let's say two spaces left, no, one, one space left, one space left, right, locates the lowest position and puts itself there. Right? Among the three positions. Among the three positions. So there are two candidates that just chooses random on the three positions. Okay. So this is uh, the first problem is called random deposition, the second is called random deposition with relaxation for obvious reasons. And so the third model is when cubes fall, they just stick to the first cube they see, possibly on the side. So these are three simulations. The different colors just give you, let's say this is a first thousand cubes, this is second thousand, third thousand. So you see the, the pictures are pretty different. So here we know that the fluctuations here, the roughness of the border, is like time to the half. That's the previous central limit theory statement. Now here and here, they are probably small. This looks very smooth. And this looks more smooth than that one, but less smooth than that one. So it's very easy to put this on the computer. That's the best we can do, actually, in, in these two situations. <laughs> And so the computer is going to tell you that this is t to the half, this is t to the quarter, and this is t to the third for the roughness of the quarter. So these are representatives of certain universality classes, the central limit theory type statements that I would like to discuss. I would actually concentrate on this one. There are certain stochastic differential equations um, that physicists would write describing the fluctuation process. Sometimes they make sense, some, sometimes they don't, and as we go along, I'll try to indicate when they do make sense, when they don't. Uh, but people who suggested the equations also gave rise to names of the universality classes. So with the, the third, the one third fluctuation, the, uh, um, the universality class has been suggested by these two people, three physicists, Cardano, Parisian, and Jan, in, in, in Mexico. Anyway, this phenomenon of having fluctuations of different sizes is, is something that seems to be interesting enough for me. Now, what's this happening? I mean, it appeals to curiosity, but also maybe has some broad applications. This slide is designed to argue that probably yes, and um, more common than you might think. So, this here is a picture of a coffee stain that hasn't been cleaned up in, in proper time. And the thing to, to look at is that the, the coffee stain has a dark rim. If you spill tea and if you don't clean it up, there will be no dark rim. The difference is that coffee is a colloidal suspension. There are actually particles there. And so when the water evaporates, what happens is that these particles get pushed to the border. 
Well, so these are pictures from the actual experiment, not with coffee, because coffee particles are too different in sizes and, and, and shapes, which makes the experiment dirty. So these are manufactured co coffee particles. They're all the same. And so this is the border of the droplet. And as the water goes out, these particles come in and they start packing. You see there are layers. They're packing, they pack. So the experiment is that one does that and then one measures the roughness of this water, the fluctuations. And so two cases can be actually be identified fairly reasonably as far as the experiment goes anyway. If you take perfectly round coffee particles or particles in there, then it turns out that the roughness is uh, as goes as wood of the height. And the, fact, the statistics is, is Gauss. And if one takes slightly elongated particles, which one is that one, right? So this is the perfectly round ones. Yeah. And these are elongated particles, so the aspect ratio is like 1.2. And then it turns out that the, the, the statistics is different, and the fluctuations are of the size to the third. And moreover, when one goes and computes the certain further statistics of the of the border, then it appears to have the same behavior as, for example, this one. All right. So we have oh, wait, there's an inconsistency between two what? pictures. Here's T to the half is rougher. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, I mean that no, it looks smoother. smoother. Yeah, that's because the size of the particle in this picture is small. But here, there are larger <laughs> particles on the picture. If you look at individual particles, these are small. That's why the roughness here. Oh, it's a different scale. It's a different scale. The horizontal scale is different. So, as co compared to the size of the particles. What if you completely elongate the particles? Yeah, then you'll, you'll, you'll get trees growing. So, there will be. Um, it's still a, a third in your salary class, which is completely not understood. The problem is that you. Okay, I'll, 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 I can explain later. The problem is that you can't run this simulation forever, not simulation, this experiment forever, because if you get too many layers, what happens is that the three-dimensional structure of the droplet comes into, into play, and you start seeing packing in space, which is a completely different okay. So when, if, you, if you do completely elongated particles, you start trees, you see trees growing, but you can't grow them too much, and then you just don't know what you're looking for. So that's roughly the Okay, so 1.2 is boundary. 1.2 that's the ratio of the longest axis of the ellipsoid to the shortest axis. Is that a boundary for the behavior before it? It's hard to say. So 1.2, 1.3 appear to give the same statistics, and then uh, experimentalists measure two and higher, and that, that is tree growing. That's a different object already. But the experiments, you can't do it too many times, the resources are limited. So, but it seems that the neighborhood of 1.2 is a fairly stable uh, region where things are similar. Okay, so um, as I said, the understanding of the universality is sort of very far from what people can do, either mathematicians or physicists. So let's at least try to understand what the answer is supposed to be. Um, so this is an example of an integral model in the class, if we try to explain what it is. That's a growth model for which we can prove many things. It's called the totally asymmetric simple exclusion process. It's a fancy name, usually abbreviated to five letters, TASA. And so the, the, the growth is actually very simple. So the interface is given by a broken line with segments of slope 1 and minus 1 and standard length. And the growth is that at each local minimum, you can put a new box independently in the known locations with exponentially distributed waiting time. Or if you prefer to think about the discrete time, think that at each second, at each local minimum, with probability half there is a new box. So then this thing starts growing. The name um, for the model actually came from a different interpretation. If you project this broken line to a lattice that's drawn, with every segment of slope minus 1 going to a particle, and every segment of slope 1 going down to no particle at home. Then the, the picture, the interface, is encoded by a bunch of particles in the one-dimensional letters. And then the time evolution is the following. Each particle tries to jump independently to the right by one unit with the random waiting time. And if the spot is empty, it just goes there, 
whenever it tries, and if the spot where it tries to go is full, then there's no jump. There is an exclusion constraint. That's a very, very simplified model of cars on freeway. There are cars going, and then if there are spaces in front of you, then there is a chance that you will accelerate and, and shorten the distance to the garden. It's amazing how much structure actually this model has. But if you, here is a simulation, and the computer cooperates, I will, I will try to show. So this is the real-time simulation with a particular initial condition. There are many cars, they all pack on the left side of the, of the lattice. Uh, there is nothing here, so initially only the first car can go. Geometrically, the initial condition is um, um, this wedge. So it would be slowing down, and then um, so as I start running, if you see that the car, the things start unpacking, the car start going, and the corner start you know, gets to fill. So I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up, and then I'll also rescale it. Okay, so this is what happened. And so you see that the interface is growing, it's filling the corner, and in the first approximation it, it should be pretty obvious that the, there is a smooth curve that approximates the profile. This smooth curve actually happens to be parabola, in this case, that touches the two axes of the two ones. And on the question that I put, the, the two to the one third fluctuations are uh, these fluctuations around this graph. Right. So the fluctuations that we want are the fluctuations of the blue broken line around that graph. How come it's mostly above? Hmm? How come the blue is mostly above? Now that's, I'll answer that question. That's because the fluctuations are not necessarily, so the parabola ah. is something that's easy to write, but the expectation of the difference is not zero. That's why it's mostly. Right, so what we've just seen is, is called the hydrodynamic limit. It's when, um, um, it's deterministic. So this parabola has no randomness left to it. It's a general phenomenon. If you start that model from a very broad class of initial conditions, and then you zoom out, you, you scale the space and time in the same way, then the profile, the density evolves deterministically according to the shock equation. I and mean, this converges equation here and through the down. So it's um, the first order equation solvable by characteristics. It develops shocks, which are traffic jets we're all familiar with. For some boundary conditions, there will just be shocks. It's not hard to, to actually derive that, and, and this is this is a well proven statement actually. It's, yeah. Since the beginning of the 90s, there was an industry improving this, these types of hydrodynamic state. Okay, what about the fluctuations? That's a harder question. And so let me take a specific initial condition, the one that I have shown. So all particles are packed on one side, nothing on the, on the right. On the particles on the left, nothing on the right. That's the simulation, the parabola and the broken line. It's a hyperbola, isn't it? Not a problem. It's a parabola. It's going to touch here and here, the two axes. It's not going to go asymptotically. Because the first particle has a finite speed. So the first particle, I know exactly where it is because it's just doing a random walk, and it's a finite distance. So this curve is going to intersect the wedge. It's not going to actually intersect it, it's going to touch it. It's a little off, but I can go back to the simulation and run it again. Um, This is actually a piece of the parabola that, that's cut off at the point where it touches that wedge. Right. So then what I really want to do, I want to zo zoom in at some point of the parabola. I took the midpoint. So I'm taking the vertical section essentially, looking. I want to know the distance between the two curves, the blue and the red. And so the statement that was really the first statement proven I think it's the mathematical or physical world in that direction is due to Kurt Johansson in the end of 90s. And it says the following. <coughs> that if I take that difference, and if I divide it by, by, by time to one third, then, well, this is the scaling that happen, that happens. This is just the parabola that I'm subtracting. This is the one third. 
Then that difference will converge to a limit, which is a random limit. It has a distribution. And that distribution actually was determined before that work, a few years before. It now has a name. It's called crazy William distribution for the largest eigenvalue of random emission matrices. I'm about to explain what it is. It's not the Gaussian distribution. So this is how this distribution came about. It comes from the big domain called random matrix theory. And um, one of the simplest examples of random matrices is the Gaussian random ma Gaussian emission random matrix. So one takes a random matrix and emission matrix. And one declares that the, uh, the matrix elements that can be independent have to be independent, and they have Gaussian distribution. So formally, the density of the measure is e to the minus trace of h squared, where h is my matrix. And this is essentially a unique distribution that's unitarily invariant, so invariant under conjugations, and also has independent uh, matrix elements. It was introduced by Wigner in hopes of modeling um, neutron resonances in heavy nuclei. So it was supposed to model um, the Hamiltonian that was too complicated to understand, and so we can just declare that we don't can't understand it, let's assume it's random. And if you look for distributions that would give something similar to experimental data, and he succeeded. This was one of the things. Anyway, so uh, I don't care about nuclei for now. Um, let me just take that matrix, let me look at its spectrum. Its spectrum, if you look at the histogram, it will actually be a semicircle. But again, I don't care about that. I'm looking at the large eigenvalue, or the largest one. There is a law of large numbers that says it's approximately the root of 2m. And then there are fluctuations. If I divide by the right constant, then there will be a distribution. This is the distribution that Tracy and William identified in the beginning of my disk. It's not easy to write it down, but one way to say what it is is that if one takes this minus log of, of the density of the distribution function second derivative squared, and this function satisfies this innocent looking differential equation. This is a second order nonlinear differential equation known as the two equation. It has remarkable properties that go, that go beyond the goals of my talk. I'm happy to answer questions later about it. Um, it was found by Penderbe in the beginning of the century, and, and Penderbe equations in general appear in, in various inexpensive cases. Okay, so it's this distribution that governs the distance between the, the blue and the red. Now, um, one can do the same thing. Actually, that's what, what Wigner was more interested in. When it feels symmetric matrices, it's not emission matrices. And then the same scheme applies, and one gets a different distribution. I'll call it F1 as opposed to F2. 2 refers to complex numbers, 1 refers to yields, and there is also F4 that refers to the But I won't do it. Okay, so then um, the next step is that maybe one should change the initial condition. So I, I took a very specific initial condition, a very specific model, and I said there is something that allowed me to compute the fluctuation. So here are, this is a brief sort of state of the art. What if I took a different distribution, namely, what initial condition? What if I took the situation when the initial interface is approximately flat? Well, in terms of particles, it means I have a particle, a hole, a particle, a hole, and so on. That's a very different picture, and so that, when that evolves, the picture is approximately translation in there, you know, approximately translation in there, and it will stay that way. So the low flash number is going to be flat. The fluctuations are also going to be of size t to the one-third, and the law of fluctuations is actually going to be f1 rather than f2. The problem switches the, the symmetry class of random matrices. Nobody quite understands why, but that's a, that's, that's a proven result. Furthermore, if you take a hybrid, if you take half-flat initial condition, meaning you have particle, hole, particle, hole, on half-flats, then as you run time, the first particles will speed up, and then in the tail there will be particles
both that don't know yet that there is this empty spot here that they can fill. So the limit shape will have a curved shape, a curved piece and a flat piece. And on the curved piece, there will be a two fluctuations. On the flat piece, there will be a one fluctuation. So the current conjecture about the universality is that in a certain class, which I'm about to describe, whenever they put the, 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 there is a curved piece, this should be an F2. Whenever there is a flat piece, there should be an F1. And that's as much as the universality goes. We're very far from proving that, but for a number of models that I will list, this has been very far. And I want to emphasize this is very much a conjecture coming from mathematicians, because these, the analysis came from mathematicians. And later on in the talk, I'll try to, to, to indicate why. So, in a way, that came as a surprise to physicists. So, the universality class is roughly identified, but the fact that it splits, for example, according to the geometry of the, of the limit shape. That was nowhere to be seen before the actual integrable example for that. So what's the universality class in this situation? As I said, it's called part R or Cordijani universality class. And here is a vague, but actually not so vague, description of it. So the growth, these are growth models in one plus one dimension. So you have an interface that grows. The interface is in the plane. And there should there's supposed to be three features of the growth. First, the growth is supposed to be local. That means that the way the interface is growing here is independent of how it's growing here. There may be local dependencies, but they, they cannot stretch too long. So the second condition is that the model is supposed to have relaxation. That essentially, a uh, smoothing mechanism, the way it That essentially means that you're not allowed to have fractal fingers grow. You're not allowed to have very thin fingers that, 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 that proliferate from the interface. What about the rules for sure that? That's a different matter. They can be different. So as you can see here, that is enforced by the fact that the cubes I'm, I, I'm adding are already set. Uh, this model here, the relaxation, is actually done by the moving of the cubes. So the mechanisms could be different, but there has to be a relaxation. Let's debate this sort of in the definition. Now, the last condition is actually even more vague. So, okay, I wanted to say, so the, the, so here, there is no relaxation. The columns two don't talk to each other, so that certainly doesn't fit into the result. So these two, they both fit into the two conditions that I said. So the third condition is that the growth is supposed to be natural. So what it means is that if you have a droplet, that droplet is supposed to go sideways somehow. Now what it means, sort of more concretely, is that if you measure the vertical speed of growth, then it has to be dependent on the slope near that point. Because if you have a very steep slope, then if you go sideways, then the vertical uh, component is small. So it turns out that this is satisfied here. Things grow sideways. <coughs> it's not satisfied here, actually. It's easy to see that whatever your slope is, the amount of cubes you get on a piece of the board is always the same. So, you see, this is not a great mathematical definition, but still, if you have a concrete model, it's fairly easy to say whether it's there or it's not there. And so far, nobody was able to, to claim that there's a model that fits these three conditions that's not in that universality class, either numerically or only. Okay, so the, the TASEP, or the, the SCARS model, is actually one representative that's solvable in that class. There have been other representatives that were investigated. This is a brief list, and these were investigated using the techniques known by different names in different fields, prefermions, non-intersecting paths, determinantal point processes, these are the names that have been used. Now, other versions here are that um, these time, the, the particles could move according to discrete time, as I said before. There could be, um, so my, my TASA group was that the particle tries to jump, and then um, if the spot is occupied, there is no jump. Another rule could be that if the spot is occupied, the particle looks for the first empty spot and then goes there. So that actually also falls into the same class. Um, the name we gave it is, is Fushasset, because another interpretation is that the particle tries to jump, it's occupied, 
the particle just pushes over everybody in front. Sort of a root, the root version of the of the uh, of the cardinal review way. The uh, last passage preparation models and the claim with certain special weights. I'm not going to give definitions. If you've seen it, you, you know what it is. And I'm happy to tell you later if, if you want to know what it is. And then something called the nuclear growth processes. That's another class of processes of random growth. What happens? So this this has been happening since um, the end of the 90s. Uh, more recently, in the last three years or so, maybe four. Um, there has been a lot of progress in understanding representatives in, in this KPZ class that are not free fermions. So they're, they're not solvable by determinants, they are sort of on the next level of, of, of difficulty, certainly. And so examples for, for, for that class is, so the first one I listed is ASSEP. So this is TASSEP without the T, which was totally. So this is the model with particles that they allowed to jump not to the right, but also to the left. That ends up being much harder, but that has been analyzed by now. And then we, 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 there are other examples too that, that um, there is a list of them. So there has been progress. Sort of thing. The main actually point in, in the progress is that we managed to move beyond the, um, the determinantal case. So it's sort of in, in, in the integrable lattice model world, it's Sort of the step from, from the easy model in, in two dimensions to the, uh, something like X and Z square I small instead. There. It's a conceptual step. It's something that, that was completely not obvious that could be done. Okay. So um, <clears throat> I left myself, myself some time. <clears throat> I want to try to increase the space dimension even more. Right? So now I want to talk about interfaces in three space. This is much harder. And to emphasize the partners, um, so these are three examples of um, interfaces in, um, in three dimensions, built out of standard one by one by one cubes. I hope you see the three dimensional structure. Actually, that's the same interface. <laughs> Just look from different angles. Right? Even that is not too obvious when you look at the picture. And so what would be the natural growth for such an interface? So the first example, given what we've seen so far, probably would be to say the following. Look at all the holes, or local minimum, and just stick a one by one by one cube there, independently at all locations with random weighting time. Okay. Certainly it's going to be a growing interface. Nobody knows anything about that. With zero information. Now, if you run the simulation, there is certainly a limit shape that's evolving. Suppose that there should be a partial differential equation governing that growth. It's unknown. You want to know the fluctuations about it. People measure it numerically. They say the, it's like time to a power, and the power is 0 0.24, and they swear it's not one quarter. But that's roughly the state of the art. So it's a very open, very open. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give an example of an integrable model, which is not the simplest one I described, but I think it's not too far off. So I'll give it a little later. But before I'll go there, I want to say that there has been a different direction of progress here. So these are some pretty pictures. What are these pictures? These random interfaces in three dimensions are known to exhibit beautiful limit shapes. So this first picture is the following. One takes the corner of the room, and one puts a million boxes there, one by one by one boxes, completely packed, no overhands, no holes. There are many ways to do it, very many. Put a uniform distribution on all of them, and draw a representative uniform regression. The picture you will see will look like that. So this is like a, a square dust. And the, so it, it's approximated by a smooth um, surface. It's an algebraic surface. One can give an equation for that. And it's the that picture. Like dirt in the corner of the room. Dirt in the corner of the room. That's right. Pretty algebraic. Now that, so this, this here is actually dirt in, in the room with one, two, or three corners. And you see it starts merging here. So you can put different boundary conditions. Still, it's still an algebraic curve. It's not too visible. So there will be a cusp here in the limit shape and another cusp here. 
Let's do an explicit, an explicit surface action. And this is um, another example. So this is even fancy boundary conditions. And um, the limit shape here, the border, is actually carbon wood. And uh, um, there's been beautiful work about that. The corner, or that's two-dimensional? So this, this is, there are two ways to look at it. It's as, if you look at it as an interface, it's in three dimensions. But you can also look at it as a tile, and then it's a two-dimensional tile. You can picture the interface as tile of the plane with one by of three types, and then it's a two-dimensional. So the cardioid is a two-dimensional object if you look at this two-dimensional. So then, a parallel question is, can one actually grow these shapes? So, so the statements that I made are, draw a picture of the dust in the corner at random. It's not such an easy thing to do. It's actually a very difficult thing to do. But if somehow you invent a, a dynamic procedure of putting one box at a time that grows this thing, that would be a different matter. So that's, that's another sort of question. Anyway, so... Um, I'll try to answer both. And so here is an example of an integral growth model in, in two space, in, well, in three spaces. I'll start with the initial condition. So this is the initial condition. So here, this is, these are two things that are just stuck right there. An open book at 90 degrees, if you like. And this is the picture that I will use to represent it. So hopefully you see this here is the floor, and this here is the wall. And I'm going to put particles in the centers of the rhomboid that represent the wall, so the vertical rhomboid. It's going to be easier for me to so I'll describe first the dynamics in the language of particles. In the same way for TASAP, I have two ways of describing it. The cars and the boxes. So I'll start with the cars picture here. But this is the initial condition. In order to describe how things evolve in time, I would imagine that these particles have a hierarchy on them. So this is the, the heaviest one, this is the boss, these are also bosses, but they have to respect this one, and, and so on. And then the dynamics works in the following way. Each particle tries to jump independently of the others to the right by one. So each of these little circles tries to go to the right by one. In order, so the, there are complications, similar to TASA, things will block. So here, there are two types of complications. In order for the picture to represent the surface, these particles need to interlace. Very easy to see by drawing pictures. And so when a particle tries to jump, it can break the interlacing with either a particle above or with the particle below. And then the way this is resolved is according to the hierarchy. So if the interlacing is being broken with the particle below, the jump is forbidden, because you cannot overtake your boss. And if the particle tries to overjump the particle above, it just pushes that particle over, because you don't care about what the wider guys are doing. So according to that rule, the particle that lives at the bottom is just going to do a random walk. It doesn't care about anything. And that's the big boss. And then the next two will respect that particle, and so on. So, let's, so this is a, these are snapshots of how things may go. This is my initial condition. Initially, only these particles can jump on the right edge because everybody else is blocked by particles in the way. Let's assume this one jumps first. If it goes, then it has to push this one and this one because the interlacing condition requires that. That one happens. These went on. And then here, the, um, the fuel floor can jump. Let's say this one jumps. It goes by one over. It shifted. And this one jumps. It goes by one over. pushes that one. Now, the ge geometrically, what it means, now I know that the room is actually split in two halves, in two non-equal non halves probably. There are two ways to view each of these pictures three-dimensionally. You can either view it as a full corner with a few boxes taken out, or as an empty corner with a few boxes that are being put in. I'll take the point of view that this is empty because I started with empty. So this is empty and then I put a few boxes in. So what do I do with geometric? Actually, what I do, my dynamics, what it does, it adds all possible sticks stretched in one direction in whatever positions I can independently in such a way that there are no, no holes and no openings. 
Now, this is more complicated than just adding one by one by one boxes, certainly. That, as I said, is very difficult, because nobody knows what to do. But still, this is not too bad, or at least I want to bring this is not too bad. And just adding sticks of that type, and then my thing starts filling. I have a simulation for this too. So, um, here it is. Actually, this is too large. Um, it's a little, it's drawn in a weird way. So there is an affine transformation that happened for some reason. And when I look at that picture, I want to think of the cubes being taken out, actually, of the full picture. But I know that we can also look the other way. It just needs to be split. Anyway, I hope you see that there are these sticks that are being either added or removed to the boundary condition. Removed? Well, it depends on your thing. Oh, what do you do? Why did you choose either one or the other? The one I chose in the previous picture, you add things. But somehow, whenever I look at this simulation, it seems to be that you so put it, you put it wherever you want to. Yeah. This, this is the log thing. Right. As long as there are no holes or holes. Oh. Yes. Random. Right. <coughs> right. Every every spot has a random clock where you put this. Okay. So this thing grows. Actually, I, I, I can speed it up much faster. Okay, so this is what's happening. It's growing. And it's not hard, again, to convince oneself that what will happen is that there is a smooth limit chain that approximates this thing. And then we've got the same set of questions. What is that limit shape? What are the fluctuations? What's the universality class? I'm claiming this is an integrable example, so presumably I can say things about it. And so I will. And so let me say things about it. Actually, before I do, let me point out the connection with, it, with, with passing. If we just look at the left, the row of particles, so leftmost particle in each row. Then these evolve in an independent way, and they evolve as passive. Because each particle can only be blocked by somebody in front. So there is a the previous example on the corner of that picture. Then if I look at the rightmost edge, then each particle when it jumps, it can push things in front, and there's no block. That's the root passive, the push acid that they have. There is a third thing, which is if I just look at the horizontal growth and I look at the evolution of that, that ends up being Markovian too. And that is closely related to what's called Dyson Brownian motion for random matrices. But when I talked about random matrices, I said all matrix elements are Gaussian. There is a natural way of putting time on random matrices, namely you replace the Gaussian by Brownian motion. Independent motion. That gives a certain evolution of the spectrum. It's a Markov. Brownian motion in the group? No. Each matrix element, which used to be a one dimensional Gauss, and it just put the Brownian motion there. That leads to, uh, the, uh, to a Markov process on eigenvalues It's called Dyson Brownian motion. And so this dynamics actually on each slice behaves in the same way. Actually, its diffusion limit is exactly the passing one. And so this picture, if you, if you will, actually adds to, as an explanation of the surprising fact that random matrices should have something to do with the random, with the growth of interfaces. Because so far that was a computational fact. So this picture puts, the, puts both objects sort of into one. Anyway. So, um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that, so I showed an example of the dynamics. A very similar dynamics, which I'm not going to explain in detail, can be used to grow dust in, in the corner of the room. So what I say here is that what actually you do is, as time grows, you increase the support. So this is sort of an unnatural way to put the dust in. The dust is still in the room left to right. So this is the support that, that I shaded here. And so as the time grows, it, the support increases until eventually it fills the hole. So there is a way to grow those pretty algebraic shapes in, in a similar way. Okay. So the integrability gives results. What kind of results it gives? First, as I said, there is a limit shape. Um, so what is higher than any scale? And that means that the time and space are scaled in the same way, by the same constant by the same large constant. You allow both, both in time and in space in the same way. Oh, it's 1, 1. This is 1, 1 here. 
The word hydrodynamic comes because this facet can be viewed as a, what we call a driven lattice gas. And so you can think of it hydrodynamically as sort of a one dimensional gas. And that's why. <coughs> Okay, so there is, a, there is an equation that governs the evolution. It's, all, it's again a first order equation. It can, it can be solved by characteristics. The, the, there is a, um, well, this F here, I didn't write, write down. It's, it's explicit, it's not as simple as the short equation, but it's explicit. Now, what about the universality class? So, as I told you, if I just put single boxes, then nobody knows what it is. Now I'm telling you, I found an integral example. So shouldn't I be able to take inf information from that example and use it to predict what happens in the one by one by one box? That's what I first thought. Not so easy. It turns out that the, this KPZ class splits in two plus one dimension in two subclasses called isotropic and anisotropic KPZ. The way physicists explained it is that if you write the nonlinear equation that hypothetically is supposed to govern the fluctuations. This equation makes no mathematical sense whatsoever. Nobody knows how to make sense of this equation in 2 plus 1 dimension. In 1 plus 1 that we know, in 2 plus 1, no idea. But you can still write it as simple. Okay, so the equation is that the... It makes sense we prove something about it? No, it just makes sense. Explain what the solution of this equation would be. The right hand side is way too similar. See, there is a white noise on the right hand side, which is very, very rough. And so you, you can't differentiate it and square. It's just this distribution theory doesn't go that far. And it's, it's like trying to square delta functions. It's just. But you can, you can write the equation as a symbol. And so there's a Laplace, and there is a nonlinearity here. And the nonlinearity is a quadratic nonlinearity in the gradient. Quadratic forms in dimension 2 have an invariant, which is the signature. It could be 1, 1 signature, 1 minus 1 signature. And that, this is the claim, should give rise to two different universality classes. And it appears that happens, even though the equation makes no sense. The fluctuations for this class. So, what are the fluctuations? I take my picture, I pierce it by needle, and then I measure the distance between the limit shape and the step surface. So that actually grows as the logarithm of time here. Not algebraically, not as time to a power, but logarithmically. So this is this hops the surface much closer. And the I mean the, the next question is what happens if you pierce it by two needles? Do the fluctuations have anything to do with each other? And here the answer is actually, I mean, the, the answer is always meaningful, but in this case the answer is given by a beautiful object called the Gaussian tree field. And I, and I will explain it a little bit Again, once all this is known, there's a pretty good chance that this, this should hold true for any more than the same universality class if you manage to explain what that what that. Okay, so I want to explain the Gaussian tree field, so I want to explain the fluctuation. So I take that model, it's just a different three dimensional interpretation of my integrable model, and then I subtract the low fudge numbers, so I subtract the, the smooth surface. This is what I get. Now this is extremely rough. So this is random. And actually, it's actually so rough that there is no function one can fit to this thing. This is a random distribution. This is a random generalized function. It turns out that if you smooth it against anything reasonable, even against the smooth density on the curve, then you get something meaningful. But as an object drawn like that, it's a distribution. It makes no sense. It has no value as a component. But what is that distribution? So that distribution is, is well known. It's actually a conformally invariant distribution. It's called the Gaussian tree field, and in order to see this, one needs to do a rather non-trivial procedure. One needs to map this domain, this limit shape, to a complex plane. I need a complex structure to define the Gaussian tree field. 
That meant it rather not trivial. It's not the natural projection to one of the to one of the coordinate planes or anything like that. It's not subtle than that. It, the Kenya should be credited for defining the, the right coordinate in a different model. But once you do that, the fluctuation object is the following. It's very easy to describe in abstract terms. So there is a okay, so there is a map, I will map it to the upper half plane. I could have taken a different model space, I could have taken a distance. I'll take the upper half plane. Then I'll take the Laplacian there. Actually, what I say doesn't matter what it means. I'll take Laplacian there and put the zero boundary conditions. That gives me some eigenfunctions I call them theta, with eigenvalues which I call lambda theta. I arrange them into a series with random coefficients. The CKs here are going to be independent standard gaps. This sum is almost surely diverges at any point. But if you integrate it against anything decent in omega, you get a convergent series, which is a Gaussian random derivative. So this is the fluctuation object that well, this is the object that it gives you. And then again, so this is the this model was actually the first example of a model in this anthropic KPC class that was analyzed. And so then this prediction actually came out that was not out there. The law was predicted by some weird manipulation with the normal, but the Gaussian field was not, and so that's sort of the integrability property played its role here in a way. We found one point, the first point, which predicts the behavior of the, of the class. All right. So, um, to conclude, I want to say the point. The way I built this talk is that I speak in, or try to speak in probabilistic language. I talk about hardware processes, law for numbers, learning theory, and things like that. The truth is that the approach underneath is largely algebraic. And the reason why the models are integrable, well, that's probably not surprising, is because there is a lot of algebraic structure underneath. So the probabilistic world is, is rather fluid. If you, if you have a probabilistic model, you typically can tune a parameter a little bit, nothing will change. The algebraic world is much more rigid. They are very rich structures. You, so if I take any of my models, if I tune one thing, I won't be able to say anything about the triggers. Oh, I know it should be in the same class. But the whole structure just... just so so the, the structures that are behind are those, as I said, coming from representation theory. And so the hierarchy of the integrable models, it shadows the hierarchy of the multivariate special functions that, that come up in representation theory. So those are the character well, uh, okay. Right. So those start with the characters of the classical E groups, and then it goes above to go to the Riemannian symmetric spaces and then to to the Eddy groups and even further it goes to something like eigen eigenfunctions of uh, or there are Sutherland models that are that, that arbitrary coupling parameter, which doesn't correspond to any group per se, but is also very much, a, uh, very much an object in, in the same domain. And so this is, this is roughly the hierarchy. It's, it's, it's a remarkable hierarchy of these um, um, special functions of representation theoretic origin. So what sits below, <coughs> there are different colors here. So the colors correspond to objects, so the, the, the big ones, these are the probabilistic names that, that are being introduced, they're probably not going to say much. Um, the green ones are more basic probabilistic objects, and the, the blue ones are the representation theoretic objects behind. So if I start with the bottom, these, are, these things are related to true functions, that's why they're called true processes. The true functions come up to characters of either symmetric or unitary groups. And then the way historically the process went is that they were generalized in two directions, to here and to here. There are two parameters that people now put traditionally there, q and t between 0 and 1. The shoe, shoe functions correspond to the diagonal of t. There are two, two one-parameter parameterizations introduced in the 60s for different reasons. The so-called jackpot and jackpot came up here 
when a statistician named Jeff was computing certain integrals over um, over real symmetric matrices, and he, he noticed that he could introduce a polynomial that interpolates between real symmetric emission and quaternion matrices. Now, the whole level of polynomials were introduced by Paul and then Littlewood, not the most famous Littlewood, turns out, but his student, who was not related to him as far as Wikipedia knows. Um, and it's also one parameter family. The parameter comes from the P in theatre groups. And then, in a fairly remarkable development in the, in the 80s, Ian McDonald united the two families into one. Sort of in a very ad hoc way. Uh, just look, you know, if you do that, then you get something that degenerates to this thing and this thing. Well, by now, McDonald polynomials gave rise to a very active domain representation theory. You've probably heard of double affine Heck algebras or Chernik algebras. Um, it's a deep and, and hot domain. And so that's sort of the, as, as far as, as we can go probabilistically, but then also you can sort of go down. So something like quantum groups or Q-deformed total quantum total letters lives here, and that corresponds to certain probabilistic models, which are Q-deformation of concept and also the, um, the directed polymers at, at, at the temperature. And then, um, so in each of these, of these boxes, there, is a, there are probabilistic models that and the representation theoretic background really provides tools to deal with the models. These are probability models which you can solve using those boxes. Yeah, so in each box, there is a set of probabilistic problems that can be solved ah. using that so particular. What's the probabilistic thing at the very top box for McDonald's? Yeah, so here I can write it down. I cannot sell it to probabilists yet. <laughs> I, I, I can sell things in each of the boxes below. But the algebraic sort of framework that sets up the solution, it lives up here. And so you take it and then you can push it down any of those arrows. There are probabilistic measures here, but it would take hard. That's your secret. It's my secret web. Yeah, right. But um, as I said, so far it's been hard to, to convince probabilists that they should be learned. Anyway, what, what lives here or here or here is actually pretty convincing. The random matrix theory, the general data that we get here, and then said polymers look here, and then random matrices on the finite fields look here, so this is uh, it's quite sellable. And actually, there, there was interest by, by different people in, in the objects independently. Um, the, the framework gave, gave new insights and some kind of tools. Anyway, I understand that this is certainly not enough to, to, to explain the essence of the methods. If, if you ever want to take a look, there are, I've given lectures in, in some of the pieces where there are write ups for the notes and, and the, there are numbers, there are archive numbers down here, but you can also just search on the archive with my last name and there will be lecture notes there. But I would, but try to explain the, the, the picture. The, there is sort of a conflict of, of civilizations here because trying to marry some algebra and probability. Okay, it's, it's interesting and I enjoy it a lot, but trying to actually find a person who would be willing to listen sort of to both sides, that, that's that's a challenge, but it's been improving, so I'm hopeful that, that the numbers will increase. But to me it was fun anyway, so it continues to be fun. Thank you very much. Thank you for the beautiful talk. So let's see if there are any questions. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so now this mysterious appearance of random matrices is fully understood through, through the structures. Well, so, so the understanding I would like to perform is the following. We need to, to, to go up one step from the growth models and from random matrices. And what we end up looking at will be representation theory of the unitary groups. So the representation theory of unitary groups by um, semi-classical limits goes down to measures on unitary groups. Right? So large representations are supposed to behave as measures. So that's the link to random matrices on one step. 
On the other hand, the representations of unitary groups are parameterized by discrete objects, highest weights. And so on those, it's not too hard to come up with the dynamics that will lead to the exclusion processes of the class of like objects. So there is a common parent. What I'm saying is that there is a common parent to both objects. And so the statement that they have the same asymptotics brings both of, both of them down. What I'm saying is actually a parent, so instead of just looking at them going down, think of a parent that goes down in two different ways. So that's the explanation of why the two, the two things actually have a common answer. That's the one I know. But then physicists may want to have a different explanation. Sometimes they do. And I, I, I wouldn't say this is a completely satisfying explanation to, me, to everybody, but I'm welcome with my head. So you said that McDonald is the ad hoc putting together of the two discussions. Said yeah. it's kind of ad hoc, right. where you made formulas put together. Something yeah. like that. So the way he described it, what he did is the call. He looked at um, right. So he looked at the jet polynomials here, and there were formulas due to a Japanese mathematician named Sekiguchi of higher um, quantum integrals. So jet polynomials they satisfy uh, their eigenfunctions functions of um, Schrodinger operator, second order operator, Laplacian plus a potential. And then there was a construction of higher order differential operators that had them as eigenfunctions. The construction was pretty difficult to understand, and so McDonald was trying to understand it. And then for doing that, he tried to Q-deform. Well, so he managed to Q-deform that system of operators. He came up with something. That something was McDonald polynomials. He would later realize, actually, so his main achievement, I think, before that was actually the representation theoretic meaning of all little bit polynomials that lived here in the PL representation theory. And so once he saw that object, he also saw the challenge. That's the, the thought process he himself describes in the book. That's as much as that. Uh, I think you also answered the second half of my question, which is going to be if you did something in an ad hoc manner, then you seem to be working up there with some fairly precise structure. Yeah. So was that structure kind of related to what the story you just told, or was that so, like a new structure? So the um, no, so the structure of double affine Hecke algebra came after the work. Yeah. So that's when people were trying to prove for charity for one. Um, so called McDonald's conjectures. So he put forward certain conjectures, essentially evaluating normalizing constants and things like that, that he thought must be there. And he checked some cases, I guess, but he wasn't able to prove it. And then Charity came out with a representation theoretic setup that proved McDonald's conjectures. And that's how the representation theory got into the business. So I don't think that the, the object is at hoc. I don't think about it at uh, all. Yeah, no. It's a canonical object, but the way McDonald got there was well, very much at hoc. Okay. Any other questions? OK, so let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and uh, if you are interested, you should do the topic session before. Thank you.